Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Uh-oh. I think it's time for Dark Poutine. Hello, I'm Mike Brown, the creator and host of this business. And uh, with me... Me. Yes, Matthew. <laughs> Welcome back, sir. Thank you for having me. How was your week? My week was good. I took the public transport here today. You did. You took the Sky Train. Mm. Yeah, and because uh, it's only a quick walk. And then Matthew got us some submarine sandwiches <laughs> yes. from a place known to have a bready, bready sandwiches. Yes, it was yummy. They were yummy. Yeah. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense, and some listeners may find it disturbing. We're not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We're ordinary Canadian schmoes chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. The classiest show on the interweb. Oh, the interweb. <laughs> This is a story of two talented people whose final interaction would lead to the death of one of comedy's rising stars and a notorious place in Hollywood history for the other. On March 5, 1982, after an all-too-brief but stellar career in film and television, actor and comedian John Belushi, 33, was found dead in his bungalow at the infamous Chateau Marmont on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood, California. Investigators soon discovered that a Canadian woman, Catherine Evelyn or Kathy Smith was the last person with the star and had been the person who had supplied and shot him up with the fatal overdose that killed him. You are listening to Dark Poutine episode 182, Sundown, The Death of John Belushi. I've been considering tackling this story for some time. A creative hero of mine, John Belushi is one of those once-in-a-generation talents which is quite an accomplishment considering the company he kept. Dan Aykroyd, Chevy Chase, Bill Murray, Harold Ramis, Gilda Radner, and Christopher Guest, just to name a few. He was a comedy genius and owned every second of his screen time with his hilarious turns in films like Animal House and the Blues Brothers, and also during his time as a cast member on Saturday Night Live during its early years. John Adam Belushi was born on January 24, 1949, in the Humboldt Park area in Chicago, Illinois, to Adam Anastos Belushi and Agnes Dimitri. John's dad, Adam, was an Albanian immigrant, and his mom, Agnes, was a second-generation Albanian immigrant. The eldest of the Belushi children, John had three siblings, Billy, Marion, and brother Jim, who would go on to his own successful career in film and television. John stood out right away. A natural prankster and an imitator of local characters, he loved the limelight. John was popular with the other kids in his high school. He was the co-captain of the Wheaton High School football team, playing middle linebacker. He was also elected the homecoming king by his classmates. He was musical, too, playing drums in a band he called the Ravens, who'd already cut a record by the end of high school. John was well on his way. But his favorite way to express himself was as an actor. He was a member of the school's drama club. According to Bob Woodward's book about Belushi, Wired, John's drama teacher, Dan Payne, had never seen a talent like Belushi's before or since in all his years at the school. From Wired, Belushi played, quote, everything from ballerinas to Marlon Brando in the student variety show. Belushi's skits and jokes and his imitations were the way he communicated. 
his irreverence was pie-throwing funny, not bomb-throwing angry, and he turned it to everything in his experience, family, religion, teachers, and coaches. Thrusting his belly over his belt, Belushi could play Howard Barnes, the football coach, to perfection, as the coach explains how to grade a physical education class. One-fifth for wrestling, one-fifth for basketball, one-fifth on calisthenics, one-fifth on volleyball, and one-fifth on football, and one-half on attitude, end quote. As with many creative types, John Belushi had his demons. His widow, Judy Belushi Pisano, who'd been his high school sweetheart as well, later told the Guardian newspaper that John's parents were a source of frustration for him at times. He rarely took his friends to his house. Quote, his parents never assimilated, and I think it was hard for John, going to this all-American school in the day and coming home to this very Albanian family in the evening. None of us in the neighborhood even knew what Albania was, said Pisano, who started dating Belushi while they were in school together. John looked different from all of us, dark, and there was a joke that he had been born with a beard. So he was self-conscious of his ethnicity, and he never brought people back to his home. He always went to other people's houses. Maybe that's when he got into the habit of always hanging out with people. End quote. After high school, John had lots of choices to make. Chief among them was which path he would take to college, football or drama. John chose the University of Wisconsin at Whitewater. There was no football there, but they had a great drama program. According to Bob Woodward, John told his sweetheart Judy that he would become a professional actor by the time he was 30. Judy had fallen for the charismatic John in their junior year when she saw him playing a Nazi camp counselor in a school variety show. She knew if he said he was going to achieve something, he probably would. Young John Belushi was driven. John switched schools to College of DuPage in 1968 and he and a group of friends started an improv group called the West Compass Players and began playing gigs at local cafes and at the college's student union. John began partying regularly, smoking weed whenever he needed to unwind, which seemed like a lot. He hated booze and didn't like people who drank, calling them square. Marijuana was his thing then, but he started to experiment with LSD, which was not unusual for the era. John loved getting high and listening to music but he had a more serious and thoughtful side. From Bob Woodward's Wired, quote, He had donned the mantle of the angry young radical, anti-war, anti-Nixon, anti-clean clothes. He joined in demonstrations on their campuses, especially that spring after the Kent State shootings, end quote. John graduated from college with an associate's degree in 1970. The West Compass players continued doing gigs together around Chicago. Belushi had begun to strike out on his own. He made an impression on the Chicago nightclub comedy scene and soon joined the legendary Second City Comedy Troupe. There he began performing with some of the other future members of the Saturday Night Live cast. In 1973, Belushi starred in an off-Broadway production of National Lampoon's Lemmings to rave reviews. TV producer Lorne Michaels was impressed with the young comedian and in 1975 offered him a spot on the new late-night comedy show Saturday Night Live. When the show premiered on October 11, 1975, the show was an instant hit, and Belushi was a star. From an article on Biography.com, quote, His most famous characters were a sword-wielding samurai, a killer bee, and a cone-headed alien named Coldroth. Belushi also continued making fun of the famous with hilarious takes on the likes of Elizabeth Taylor, Henry Kissinger, Truman Capote, and William Shatner, end quote. Just like he'd predicted, he'd hit the big time. Even though he had finally achieved the success, part of John didn't feel like he deserved the adulation that he was getting. There were rumors of excessive drug use backstage at Studio 8H. Belushi was in the thick of it, and cocaine was flowing. John Belushi married Judith Jacqueline in 1976, and it was that year on the set of Saturday Night Live when John Belushi met and partied with Kathy Smith. Kathy was there as her friends, the Canadian rock group The Band, were the musical guests on the show. Kathy had a long history with famous musicians, some of the biggest. Kathy Evelyn Smith was born in Hamilton, Ontario on April 25, 1947. She was adopted soon after her birth. Her adoptive mom, Evelyn, was an ex-Ringling Brothers circus performer and her adoptive dad, Hector, was a salesman. Both of Kathy's parents were alcoholics who later sobered up in a 12-step program. She was a troubled kid who turned into a troubled teen. She quit school at 16, and Hector suggested she learn a trade, 
perhaps data processing. Kathy was more interested in music in the music scene, musicians, and the party lifestyle that went along with rock and roll. Kathy heard Bob Dylan's backup band called The Hawks at the Grange Tavern in Hamilton. She was taken with the drummer, Mark Levon, or more commonly known as Levon Helm. The pair started dating. Earlier in his career, Helm had played with Ronnie Hawkins and later founded the iconic Canadian rock group The Band, the one that had played Saturday Night Live during that ill-fated meeting between Kathy Smith and John Belushi. Kathy was only 17 when she became pregnant. She later claimed Levon Helm, seven years her senior, was the father of her baby, but he never claimed responsibility. Kathy thought about keeping the child at first, but ultimately decided to give up her baby, just like her birth mom had. She knew she was too young to be a mom. Hmm. Yeah, I heard um, she, I don't know if, this, if it was this pregnancy or another one. Mm -hmm. um, it was known as the band's baby from oh. the band, the band. Yes. Because she had been shagging all of them and nobody knew who the actual father was. Yeah, I, I have read sir, similar things to that. Yeah, I probably would have done them all as well. There you go. <laughs> Kathy became quite a singer in her own right and sang backup on a few well-known albums. Kathy had blossomed into a beautiful young woman and she caught the eye of another famous musician. Kathy met the iconic Canadian troubadour singer-songwriter Gordon Lightfoot through her association with Levon and Helm. Lightfoot, who was married to his first wife Britta at the time, had a brief affair with Kathy Smith. From a 2020 Globe and Mail article by journalist Brad Wheeler, quote, by the spring of 1971, Ms. Smith was 24 when she bumped into Lightfoot in an elevator in the downtown apartment building where the singer-songwriter, separated from his wife, lived in a funky 28th floor bachelor pad decked out with an aquarium, velvet couches, and deep pile rugs. The two reacquainted and quickly began a mercurial relationship that extended into the mid-1970s. Lightfoot and Kathy lived together from 1972 to 75. But according to music critic Robert Everett Green's 1999 article in the Globe and Mail, the singer had his share of troubles as well, and they bled into the relationship with Kathy Smith. Lightfoot, quote, developed a serious alcohol problem as his career took off, and he wrecked several long-term relationships with his womanizing. One extramarital tussle led to a broken cheekbone for one-time girlfriend Kathy Smith, end quote. During their time together came one of Gordon Lightfoot's most famous albums, Sundown. Kathy sang vocals on the track High and Dry, but Lightfoot has credited his relationship with Kathy Smith as the inspiration for the album's title track. The singer talked about what brought about the song, his most famous hit, in a Reddit AMA in 2014. Gordon Lightfoot said, quote, Well, I had this girl from one time, and I was at home working at my desk, working on my songwriting, which I had been doing all week since I was on a roll. My girlfriend was somewhere drinking, drinking somewhere. So I was hoping that no one else would get their hands on her because she was pretty good looking. And that's how I wrote the song Sundown. And as a matter of fact, it was written just around sundown, just as the sun was setting, behind the farm I had rented to use as a place to write the album. End quote. The lyrics for the song, A Favorite of Mine, are pretty dark, and Lightfoot's obsession with Kathy Smith is evident in its first few lines. It goes, quote, I can see her lying back in her satin dress in a room where you do what you don't confess. Sundown, you better take care if I find you've been creeping around my back stairs, end quote. And thanks to my own dark past, I relate to the chorus a lot too. Quote, sometimes I think it's a shame when I get to feeling better when I'm feeling no pain, end quote. Kathy later made unverified claims that the band's hit song, The Weight, was also about her. You might recognize those lyrics as well. Take a load off Annie, take a load for free. Kathy Smith was a dyed-in-the-wool party girl. As well as her love of booze, she began using heroin in the late 1970s. In Bob Woodward's book Wired, she appears as a drug dealer to Rolling Stones band members Ron Wood and Keith Richards during their touring and rehearsals as the New Barbarians. After Smith broke up with Lightfoot, she went to work for another performer. Bob Woodward wrote in Wired, quote, from 1975 to 1977, she drove the tour bus for Hoyt Axton and also sang backup for him. Smith and Axton together wrote Flash of Fire, which got on the charts briefly and continued to earn her modest royalties. In 1977, she was with Rick Danko, the bass player and singer for the band. 
Later, Richard Manuel, also of the band, flew Smith to California. End quote. During her time in California, Kathy's drug use increased and she became connected to some seriously big players in the international drug dealing business. Bob Woodward claimed this was when Kathy began dealing herself, even traveling to Thailand to purchase a kilo of pure heroin and arranged for mules to carry the drug back into the States. From Wired, quote, Smith gave a lot of parties in her apartment and she sold to hundreds of people, many she knew, many she didn't. Some were just faces or even people in cars or chauffeurs in limousines. Several drivers delivered movie scripts with cash inside. Smith kept a small book with the names, phone numbers, and addresses of her Hollywood customers. End quote. Many of those people were names you might recognize. Over the next few years, Kathy Smith became the go-to dealer for several folks around the entertainment business in Los Angeles. John Belushi's career was taking off and his drug abuse was too. And the pair of them were on a collision course that would leave Belushi dead. And we'll take a break right here. And we're back. What are your thoughts so far on uh, Kathy Smith and John Belushi? It's, um, it's interesting. A friend of mine, uh, his uncle was actual, actually Richard Manuel in the band. Yep. And uh, he, he did keyboards. You, you know who he is, right? Yes, Key, I do. Keyboards, drums, vocals. He had a great voice, mm -hmm. right? And I remember the day that he died from suicide. Yes. It's like March of 1986. Yep. And it was the first time in my life, it was like sudden and it was shocking. Like they had played a gig that d day. Yes. And he went to his hotel and killed himself. Yes. Like completely out of the blue. Yeah. I mean, he had a long history of alcohol and drug problems. Yep. And it was the first time in my life where I can remember, and I found it fascinating because I can remember the media circus around his death uh, and the media circus around, how do I say it? the brand, yeah. right? The, mm -hmm. the celebrity versus the person, the human and the effect on his family. Cause I knew his family. Right. And how they're very different things. Right. right? Yeah. Like, like what you see in the news on the shows, it's, it's different than reality. You had another sort of example of that, but you have to leave out some names obviously. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I had a boyfriend who was, very good friends with an actress who was married to an actor, both at the height of their career. If I'd said, said their names, like literally every listener would know who they are and have seen all their films. Right. And uh, they took in a friend who was dying of AIDS mm -hmm. and like got a nurse, essentially set up a little hospice in their own place to look after this guy in his last days. Yeah. Well, of course, the paparazzi took photos of uh, moving person with a van delivering a bed to the house. Yep. And the front page news was that she had kicked her husband out of the main bedroom when they were fighting and there's problems with the marriage. Right. And they were doing this wonderful thing for a person, a friend dying. Mm -hmm. And they just let it go because they weren't going to go up there and like, you know, to talk about their friend who's sick. Yeah. So they have to live with this shit. Right. And, and I think, you know, and we can talk about this at the end, you know, there's, I've always been fascinated with celebrities, not in terms of, I'm not sort of a star fucker in a lot of ways, right? Right. But um, I think because of the nature of my work and, and branding mm -hmm. and communication and moving the needle on consumer, you know, consumer perceptions. Right. I've always been fascinated with the, the brand versus the human. Yep. And I, I think, and we'll talk about this because I think there's, with Kathy, you know, it's it's easy to portray a woman as a femme fatale yeah. when a hero dies, mm -hmm. like Yoko Ono, like uh, Courtney Love, right? Um, and I've like told the jokes, right? Sure. And, but I recently stopped. Somebody called me out. I'm like, you know what? You're right. And I've seen some, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay. Yeah. yeah this is this is why I chose this episode yeah. to do. Yeah. Because there are some really interesting sort of takes that can come out of this. Yeah. And some, you, you know, we hear what the press tells us, but then there's the, the real backstory of what's yeah. really going on behind the scenes with people. Yeah. And, and we don't know. 
And I've learned that we don't know because I've, you, you, my, you used to work in the industry, you, you know, I, especially back home in the UK, I fell into a group of people mm -hmm. where there were a lot of famous people within our group. Sure. And so I kind of saw firsthand the difference between the celebrity and the person. Right. Right. According to an article about Belushi on grunge.com, Belushi's fearlessness as a performer was at odds with his innate sensitivity. Quote, Speaking on Belushi's fearlessness, late Second City alumnus Harold Ramis, best known as co-writer and co-star of 1984's Ghostbusters, recalled, quote, The first night I saw him improvising on the stage, I thought, God, I will never take chances like that. I don't have that kind of courage. But there was always something safer and more comfortable about being me than there was about being him. End quote. However, those close to Belushi remember him as a loyal man who, in contrast to the larger-than-life bombast of his characters, was deeply sensitive and empathetic. As detailed in a retrospective in The Guardian, Belushi's sensitivity ran so deep that if his cat fell asleep on his lap, he was likely to be late for rehearsal rather than wake it. End quote. Along with what appeared to be boundless energy, these qualities were a part of what made John Belushi such a compelling presence on the small screen. His popularity on SNL led to some iconic movie roles. Hollywood directors saw huge potential in John, and he easily transitioned to the big screen as well. In 1978, John Belushi burst into theaters with these three features. The films were Old Boyfriends, Going South, and, of course, Animal House. Animal House, made with a budget of only $2.8 million, went on to earn an excess of $140 million, thanks in part to John's portrayal of the wildly physical John Bluto Blutarski. After he and his Delta fraternity brothers are expelled, Bluto says, Christ, seven years of college down the drain, might as well join the fucking Peace Corps, end quote. Belushi's success kept coming. The same year, the Blues Brothers act from Saturday Night Live signed up with Atlantic Records and released the album Briefcase Full of Blues. In 1979, John Belushi starred in the Steven Spielberg flop 1941. But no worries for Belushi. Acting with his longtime collaborator Dan Aykroyd, he followed that up with films like The Blues Brothers in 1980, another cult hit, and his final two features, Neighbors and Continental Divide. They were released in 1981 to mixed reviews. Belushi was frustrated by their mild reception. He wanted to do better. There was a lot of darkness behind the scenes for Belushi. He notoriously resented the success of other Saturday Night Live cast members, Chevy Chase in particular. He was sometimes moody and refused to work with other castmates. Drugs had really taken hold of the comedian's life. According to People magazine, he was reportedly spending $2,500 a week on his habit in the months leading up to his death. He was working on a screenplay for a project called Noble Rot and was traveling back and forth between New York and Los Angeles in 1982. In the first week of March, to sequester himself and write the script while in L.A., John Belushi had checked into Bungalow No. 3 at the Chateau Marmont on 8221 Sunset Boulevard at Laurel Canyon Boulevard on the north side of the street in West Hollywood. From California Babylon, a guide to sites of scandal, mayhem, and celluloid in the Golden State by Kristen Lawson and Anneli Rufus, Chateau Marmont is, quote, perched on a slope above the strip. This hotel is modeled after a French castle, complete with gardens and impressive stone archways. Through oozing discretion, it has been the scene of many a scandal since it opened in 1929. In 1939, film mogul Harry Cohn reportedly said, If you must get into trouble, do it at the Chateau Marmont. In 1965, Liz Taylor brought her bloodied pal Montgomery Clift here, of all places and not to a hospital, after the actor was injured in an accident. They say Natalie Wood first met James Dean here, that Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward fell in love here, and that Barry Mann and Cynthia Wheel penned the hit, You've Lost That Lovin' Feelin' Here. Jim Morrison was hurt during a failed attempt to enter his upstairs room through an outside window. Members of Led Zeppelin are said to have once roared into the lobby astride Harley Davidson's, and former guests include Greta Garbo, Gene Harlow, Boris Karloff, Marilyn Monroe, Mick Jagger, Ringo Starr, Janis Joplin, John Lennon and Yoko Ono, Keanu Reeves, and dozens more. End quote. Belushi spent much of his time getting high rather than writing. He needed a supplier, 
Through his friends in the Rolling Stones, Ron Wood and Keith Richards, he was reconnected with Kathy Smith, who by then was called Kathy Silverbag, thanks to the silver purse filled with drugs that she'd become known for. She could hook Belushi up, and hook him up she did. She came to John's bungalow, and starting on March 2nd, 1982, Kathy, John Belushi, and his pal, a staff writer he knew from his time on SNL, Nelson Lyon, began a three-day drug binge, which included injecting a mixture of cocaine and heroin called a speedball. On the evening of March 4th, 1982, the party was in full swing. They ended up at a private stars-only club above the Roxy called The Rocks and went over to the Rainbow Room where Belushi ate lentil soup before heading back to John's bungalow at the Chateau Marmont. From the website realreviews.com, quote, According to Smith, Belushi asked her to shoot him up with a needle full of drugs several times that night. Belushi, who was deathly afraid of needles, seemed to like the high, she claimed. While the couple sat around in a dazed state, two famous persons stopped by to see them. Comedian Robin Williams popped in, snorted a few lines of coke, but was creeped out by Smith. He thought she was a little too crusty for Belushi and wondered what he was doing with this lowlife. Williams bolted and told Belushi, If you ever get up again, call. Sometime after 3 a.m., actor Robert De Niro knocked on Belushi's door. He'd been playing tag with Belushi all night. The scene inside the room was not pretty, so De Niro decided not to stick around. End quote. Nelson Lyon left the bungalow at around 3.30 a.m., leaving Belushi alone with Smith and making him the second-to-last person to see John Belushi alive, a distinction that made him notorious in Hollywood circles until his death from liver cancer in 2012. Kathy Smith was still in the bungalow in the morning. She signed for breakfast, claiming that Belushi was sleeping. She later said that she'd help Belushi shower before helping him into bed. John had complained of chest congestion before nodding off. Before Smith left, she checked on John Belushi again and noticed his breathing was labored, but she claimed he seemed fine otherwise. She took the spoon and syringe that she and John had been using to shoot up, in case housekeeping came by to clean the room. Kathy picked up the keys to John's Mercedes and left in it, sometime around 10.15 a.m. From Biography.com It was around noon when Bill Wallace, Belushi's physical trainer and sometimes bodyguard, arrived at the bungalow to drop off a typewriter and tape recorder that Belushi had requested. Letting himself in with his key, Wallace found the star in bed and not breathing. After repeatedly administering CPR to no effect, Wallace called Brillstein, who had his secretary call for the paramedics. Brillstein headed for Cedar sinai Medical Center where he assumed Belushi would be transported and sent his assistant, Joel Briskin, to Chateau Marmont. On his arrival at the bungalow, Briskin found Wallace weeping and still trying to revive Belushi. John's dead, Wallace cried. An ambulance arrived, and after EMTs assessed Belushi's state, he was declared dead. End quote. The word got out quickly that John Belushi was dead at the chateau. Before his body could be removed, the vultures swept in, swarming the hotel, the reporters. They snapped photos of the comedian's shrouded corpse being wheeled from the hotel and into a waiting ambulance. Dr. Ronald Kornblum was the acting medical examiner for the County of Los Angeles and was in charge of the Los Angeles County Coroner's Office. He was the person who had pronounced Belushi dead at the Chateau. Toxicological analysis and examinations determined that loose powder recovered from the dresser in Belushi's bedroom was cocaine and that two paper bindles recovered from the dresser and the items located in Smith's purse each contained both heroin and cocaine. When he conducted the autopsy on John Belushi, Dr. Kornblum observed extensive fresh needle marks on the star's arms. He also observed an absence of scar tissue, indicating to him there was not a history of long-standing drug use by injection. As mentioned before, it was known that needles were not Belushi's thing. From court documents, quote, as a result of his examination and autopsy, the results of the toxicological tests, Dr. Kornblum formed the opinion that Belushi's death was caused by acute cocaine and heroin intoxication. Dr. Kornblum placed the time of death at sometime between 10 a.m. and 12 noon on March 5, 1982. It was Dr. Kornblum's opinion that the last injection of narcotics was within four hours of the death of John Belushi. End quote. Belushi's death was investigated by forensic pathologist Michael Bodden as well, among others. While the findings were disputed, it was officially ruled a drug-related accident. During the ensuing investigation, on the day of Belushi's death, Kathy Smith was arrested and questioned by police after her return to the hotel. 
She was then released. Kathy then fled back across the border and home to Canada. Two months later, Kathy was talking. Not to the police, but to Tabloid, the National Enquirer, who had paid Kathy Smith $15,000 for her story. The title of the article was, I Killed John Belushi, with the subheading, World Exclusive, Mystery Woman Confesses. According to the article in a phone interview from Toronto, she said, quote, I didn't mean to, but I was responsible for his death. I wish it had been me who died. She continued, Every day with John was the same, drugs. In the week before he died, he spent more than $8,000 just on cocaine. And I was his gopher. I'd go for heroin. I'd test his drugs to make sure they were safe. Sometimes they're cut with things that can kill you. When I got him drugs, he'd share them with me. At 3.30 a.m., Smith told the Enquirer, I shot John up for the last time. He got his coup de grace, which is what he wanted. He had a death wish. He knew he was blowing himself apart. The cocaine put fuel in his rocket until he passed the moon, and when he couldn't get any higher, he added heroin for an extra blast. I was Florence Nightingale with a syringe. End quote. That was enough for the cops. In 1983, Kathy Smith was indicted by a grand jury in Los Angeles County. She was later charged with a count of second-degree murder and 13 more counts of administering a dangerous drug. Kathy Smith was arrested in Canada and later extradited to the United States. She pleaded down to manslaughter and several other drug charges relating to John Belushi's death. She served 15 months in prison at California Institution for Women between December 1986 and March 1988. She was deported to Canada after her release and moved to Toronto, where she worked as a legal secretary and spoke to teenagers about the dangers of drugs. A later Toronto Star article quoted Kathy Smith. She was now claiming that the comedian's death was not her fault. Quote, I didn't kill John Belushi, she wrote in Chasing the Dragon, a memoir published in 1984 while her case was still in progress. I do suffer guilt, but it is the guilt that comes from not being aware of what was really going on. End quote. In July of 1991, Kathy Smith was arrested in Vancouver with two grams of heroin in her purse. She received a $2,000 fine and a year of probation. Kathy Smith stayed out of legal trouble after her 1991 drug arrest, but struggled staying sober. After a fire destroyed her home, she moved to Maple Ridge, where she lived in seniors' housing. She died there in August of 2020. Gordon Lightfoot told the Globe and Mail after Kathy's death, quote, Kathy was a great lady, said Lightfoot. Men were drawn to her and she used to make me jealous, but I don't have a bad thing to say about her, end quote. Not everyone was so kind, but we're not going to quote any of them here. In 2004, John Belushi was honored with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, located at 6355 Hollywood Boulevard. In 2015, Rolling Stone magazine called John Belushi the best ever of all the members of the Saturday Night Live cast, Quite an accomplishment considering the number of greats who graced the stage at Studio 8H. I would have loved to see what Belushi could have done had he lived. And that's it for Dark Poutine episode 182, Sundown, the death of John Belushi. What are your thoughts on this story, Matthew? I'm going to be singing Sundown for the rest of the day. It is a fantastic song. <laughs> it just get, it gets in your ear, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of Gordon Lightfoot's songs are earworms, especially from that era. Yeah. And Kathy Smith was involved with him during that time. Yeah. And the band, same thing. Uh, yeah. The Weight, which she claimed was also about her, which I don't, in a way, I don't doubt. No, I Even don't, though it's I, unconfirmed. I don't doubt it. She was she was very integral to their mm -hmm. little scene for a long time. Yep. Yeah. I think um, I was reading this Rolling Stone article this morning mm -hmm. called Wrong Place wrong time wrong people yeah it's about kathy yep and um a friend of hers named john ponce said like he kind of had an entirely different lens of looking at kathy yeah and he said she's actually a wonderful human being they said people call her a groupie yeah but she said but she had mop floors water plants look after people's cats she's like how many groupies did that right and he said he one point pointed out one thing he said all the people that were there that night that Belushi died. Yeah. He's like, they all disappeared. 
They yeah. left Hol Kathy holding the bag. She she stands up. She gives no names. All those other people, famous people, hiding. I say they're assholes. That's what this guy said, right? Right. And she kind of became this, you know. Of course, and I think she was whacked out of her mind on drugs sure. and alcohol. Yep. And yep. when she started talking, you, you know, people do stupid shit when they're yep. at that point. She tried to clean up, as you said, years later. Right. Yeah. I want to go back to the whole idea that she was taking care of people's house plants and their cats and yeah. those kind of things. You're, you're right. It doesn't sound like that is something that un, a regular groupie, somebody who's just out to screw as many stars yeah. as they possibly can. Yeah. It sounds like she was somebody who loved that lifestyle and wanted to be around yeah. that. And there's nothing wrong with that. And she, you know, she's trying to write. She's doing backup vocals. Right, like exactly. Like, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Yeah, right? she she had talent of her own. She wanted to be involved in that business. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's it's like, you know, I talked about Yoko Ono and, you know, breaking up the Beatles, Courtney Love. Did I share, share that picture of that Courtney Love sent to a friend of mine a no. couple of weeks ago? He no. sent her a fan that, she, like, one of those, like, Spanish fans when you open it up and it says cunt. Oh, no. <laughs> and there's a picture of her fan, fanning herself with it. Sorry to use the C word, but that's what it says. And and she's like, I love it, you know. And, you know, I I, I saw that and, you know, she's moved on yeah. with her life. Yeah. And, and I was watching a documentary on David Geffen last night. Yeah. And it was really interesting because uh, they're interviewing Yoko Ono. Mm-hmm. And it's something just really struck me because the pain in her voice and doing the interview, talking about the time that Lennon died, yeah. still raw. Yeah. She loved the guy, right? Yes. And she said that at the time, and I found this really interesting, she's like, John and I didn't have a lot of friends. And when John got shot, she's like, who showed up? David Geffen. Yeah. And he actually broke the news to her that he had didn't survive and he he looked after her yeah. and it was interesting because geffen actually got a record deal with them because and this is this is fascinating she was john lennon's manager at the time mm -hmm. everyone was calling and asking for john and wouldn't speak to her right david geffen thought he knew that she was his manager so she he wrote to her yep. and set up a meeting with her and john lennon had said to her She's like, I don't know who to choose. Everyone keeps asking you. He said, wait until somebody calls you. And the person that wants to talk to you is the person we're going with. Yeah. And and it was David Geffen. Right. And, you know, and, and I think there's a lot of sexism. I think, of course, it took a gay man to not be a sexist, to not actually speak to Yoko Ono. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, but my point being, you know, it's um, the only person responsible for John Belushi's death was John Belushi. Yeah. It wasn't Kathy. Yeah. She was an addict partying with him. Right. And all of this like, oh, he, he was afraid of needles. Yep. Well, yeah, obviously not that fucking afraid of needles. Yeah. And, you know, it was, um, you know, to sort of, I think a lot, I've read a lot of articles where they, everyone throws her under the bus mm -hmm. as the responsible one for his death. He, he was going to die anyway with the, the amount that he was doing. Right. Didn't yeah, matter yeah. who was with him. Right. And again, it was, it was just sad, right? So, yeah. so, so the way it's been painted though, is that she was administering drugs to him when he wasn't even willing anymore, so out of it, he couldn't make a decision. So that's, that's kind of the way that the prosecution painted yeah. her. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that because I've had the same issue in my life yeah. as far as addiction goes. Had somebody been feeding me, I would have been happy as a little clam. Absolutely. And, you know? and she was partaking as well and yeah. out of her mind. Yeah. So, you know, it was just a mess and a shame. And a lot of artists go through this, right? Because they're sensitive souls. Yeah, exactly. And Belushi was one of those. He was he, he would beat up on himself as far as like he didn't feel like he was making it like he, he thought he should. And... Perhaps he was wasn't looking in the right places in his life. To, and and to I get things. that, you yeah. know, when I was watching this David Geffen thing, I was feeling like a total underachiever yesterday. I'm like, but you can't compare yourself to like, you know, the, the most powerful man in bloody Hollywood, right? Right. But, you know, and I'm not a creative, but I'm a creative type and I beat myself up and I, I get, I get, I totally get, even when you're at the top of your career, this sort of 
fear am I and I am I, am I good enough and what's next and all that sort of stuff. Right? I'm there right now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here for you. Yeah. I'm there right now. But I mean, at the same time, I, I'm super grateful for the way things have gone. I mean, I, I've been doing this thing for almost four years and uh, I haven't had to go to an office job for more than three. Yeah. So, you know, I can't complain. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. at the same time, you know. You complain. I complain because <laughs> it's what we do. It's, it's like the grass is always greener. Yeah. You know, I have grass is greeneritis in a big way. It's like, oh, well, I, you know, instead of being grateful for what I have and where I am mm. and uh, the exact spot that I am, even in comparison to where I was three months ago, four months ago, a year ago, 10 years ago, mm. I still think, well, that would be better. Yeah. I you mean, know, that, that outside. And, and, is, it, and is it that or so, you know, I was watching this and I wasn't comparing myself to Geffen, but what I was thinking was it was more of a self thing. It was more of a, um, are there like glass ceilings that I've, created for myself somehow yes that that i don't that i don't i don't even know that they're there mm -hmm. so i i don't know how i can break through them because i'm not aware of them and well that's why i try to examine my life and do yeah. do a uh, regular inventory on myself yeah and... because it it's sort of like you know me i've always been a bit ambitious mm -hmm. and it's it's always sort of like what's the next big thing i can do right right yeah and I like to achieve. I, I, I like to achieve the work mm -hmm. for the work's sake. Sure. Right? Yeah. And with that comes fame and fortune. I don't care well, about fame. Well, I don't... Fortune is good. And <laughs> fame, no. <laughs> there's been no fortune. And, and, uh, and the fame was... The pinnacle of my fame is being recognized by voice in, uh, yeah. in but, but, Nashville. Well, what I mean by fame and fortune is I make a living out of, out of something that I really like doing. Yeah. Right. Enough. Like I'm yeah. not like, woohoo, you know, yeah. high roller, but I make a really good living at something that Although I love. I would love to be a high roller. I want to have my own jet. Really? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't want my own jet, just a helicopter. A helicopter. Do you have a helicopter's license? I know. I don't want to fly it myself. I want to have somebody else fly it for me. Take me places. Oh, is Jeeves, that? Jeeves to the top of the mountain, please. Okay. You know, back back in London, it was the saying was, when you take the Rolls Royce out, that you have a driver. When you take the Bentley out, you drive yourself. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I can't see you driving a helicopter, flying and driving a helicopter. I can't see me doing it either. No. Especially because I'm afraid of heights. Yeah, well, and you want a helicopter. I want a helicopter to sit in. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Hilarious. And be flown about. Did you just hiccup? I did. <laughs> uh, well, there you go. I guess it's time for us to move on to voicemails. We had a few this week. Um, if you want to leave us a voicemail, you can call us at one 327 5786 or one 877 darkptn PTN. PTN. And tell us a quick story. Yeah. Stories we, are good. Stories are good. We have some interesting ones for you this week. And here is the first of those. Hi, Mike. Hi, Matthew. Um, my name is Lacey. I'm calling from Calgary. I just listened to your latest episode. And I want to say I'm not drunk. Don't listen to any drunk douche canoes telling you um, that that past a-hole is a uh, what made the show good because it's not i think the show is much better i think your wife carol was a beautiful palate cleanser and matthew is a great addition i actually really love the show more now um and i really appreciate your episodes i would definitely watch and listen to any little animated thing you did and i'm not going to tell either of you to sit in your hats because i respect you too much so you guys have a great day thank you bye Wow, thanks, Lacey. That was Lacey really nice. Lacey from Calgary. I'm flying to Calgary tomorrow. Are you? Doing a photo shoot. Matthew's doing a photo shoot. Are you wearing photo a bathing shoot. suit for the photo shoot? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, a Speedo? A one piece. Um, yeah, I'm doing a photo shoot of um, cannabis concentrates, actually. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, so sort of like food photography, essentially, right? So it's it's instead of food, it's weed. Yeah, like <laughs> wax and shatter and 
stuff like that. Well, that's fun. Yeah. There you go. But thank you, Lacey. That's Thanks, Lacey. Really nice, and we're glad that you like Matthew. I, I'm I'm especially glad Matthew that you like worries Matthew. about that. So please call uh, call us and and say, uh, yeah, Matthew is not Can, the reason that Patreon is going down. Yes, <laughs> let me correct you. I don't care if people like me or not. Yeah. I care that they like me enough that I don't fuck up your show. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know which, what I mean? Which I don't think you have at all. <laughs> because you do your homework. Uh, you come here every week with, uh, you, you try. I and, try. <laughs> right? And yeah, we've all had people in our lives who don't try. But I tried. <laughs> but I tried. I sleep in the drawer. <laughs> I'm in danger. That sounds like, what's his name? Ralph. That is. Yeah, Ralph Wiggum. All right, next up, let's listen to another. <laughs> Hi, Mike and Matthew. It's Irene Brienne calling. I had to giggle so much when I listened to the episode today from Monday. I don't live in the UK, but I guess I'm sort of European because my parents are both immigrants from the Netherlands, so I'm a first-gen Canadian here in Alberta and Lethbridge. Um, but, yeah, I've been listening to your show since the beginning, and I absolutely love it. Love you, Matthew, and love Steve and Justin and Carol. Pleasant to all you, and go shit in your hat. Wow, so thanks, Irene. Now, Irene, because of the, I think it's the, the way she donates donut money on PayPal made me think that she's from the UK, but apparently she's not. So mystery solved. She's a Netherland girl from Southern Alberta. She's a Netherlander. She, uh, Lethbridge, isn't that where Katie Lang is from? I think so. Irene, do you know Katie Lang? Constant cravings. Yeah. Yeah. Irene, Um, we like Irene. We love Irene. Irene's yeah. been listening for a long time, and she has uh, helped to keep the show afloat yes. a number of times. So, Have you ever been to Lethbridge, Mike? I have not been to Lethbridge. Neither have I. Um, I hear it's windy there. I might be wrong, but I've heard that it's windy in Lethbridge. Okay. It was windy last night here. It was. Yeah. Uh, I didn't really hear it, but some things were moved around on my balcony this morning. So yeah, we I, kind of freak out because the roof deck is like the 40th floor. <laughs> Yeah. And it gets really windy out there. Oh, no. And I've chased chairs around. Oh, I When I worked at that particular telecom downtown, mm-hmm. when it was windy one time, uh, we saw a big black box fly by the window. Wow. And it was somebody's barbecue tools. It was like a, a six foot by three foot box. Shit. Plastic box that had blown off someone's roof because it wasn't tied down in the wind. Yeah. And it, where it landed was on the grass between the sidewalk and the curb. And wow. there was a car right there. And the sidewalk, uh, there was a guy standing down there, like, looking up. Wow. And it all, so it almost hit this guy, right? Yeah. So it almost killed somebody and could have smashed a car. Yeah. But luckily, it just landed on the grass and yeah. sort of sunk itself into the grass. Yeah, there. in every, every autumn... We literally tie everything down on you our You have roof. to. Yeah. Yeah, you have to. Oh, boy. And now you're probably going to do it even more now after hearing my horror oh, story. Oh, yeah. Let's listen to another voicemail. Hi, Mike. I've been listening to Dark Poutine since your inception, and I've always intended to call and leave you some love and a voicemail. And finally today, after hearing you tell the story of my friend Sebastian Woodruff, I decided to reach out. Although the details of the case still bring tears to my eyes, I sincerely appreciate your well-rounded telling of the story. Thank you for bringing us his voice in the YouTube clip you played. Matthew's comments were at times hard to hear, but echoed some of the thoughts I've had over the last few years. He was a complicated soul who clearly struggled with internal conflict and mental health. When I lived in the Comox Valley, I adopted one of Sebastian's beloved dog's puppies and named her Lucy. The other people who adopted Lucy's siblings became our puppy family in that time of my life. I have such fond memories of Sebastian's gentle kindness and all the times we had together. He would meet us all at the park and as he approached, call out, 
puppy patrol, and all the dogs would come running to him. Uh, Sebastian's son was a young pup himself those days and accompanied his parents everywhere. I had a look back through my Facebook messages from Sebastian and found dozens of messages we had arranging for him to come and take Lucy camping to the lake or to the river just to spend time with her. One message stands out, however, as a sign of his truly generous and sweet temperament. Quote, my back door is open. If you're hungry, food is on the stove, wines above the pan rack and beers in the fridge. I don't know what happened to Sebastian's mind as I left the Comox Valley in 2013 and lost touch. My heart wrenches when I think of his last moments, but fills with joy when I remember the person he was when I knew him. As Matthew put it, the whole thing is fucking sad. Anyway, I wasn't sure I'd be able to listen to Sebastian's story, but I was confident that you would tell it with compassion and you didn't let me down, Mike. Thank you. I actually feel a little bit more closure now. And thanks again. And of course, go take a shit in your hat, you hosers. Until next time, take care. Wow. What a voicemail. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. And these are ones that I love to hear. When we hear from somebody who knew one of the people from the stories that we tell, and they are okay with the way I told the story, I feel sort of validated every single time. Mike and I talk about the stories before we record and do, we actually haven't called it this, but we kind of do a compassion check, don't we, Mike? Yep. Yep. And um, because sometimes you can get in these stories and you start getting angry and you start thinking of people mm -hmm. of, as unidimensional. Yep. And I think we're pretty good at checking each other and going, okay, well, let's, let's like put mm -hmm. ourselves into like the human shoes. So I, I'm glad, I know some of it was probably hard, um, but you know, I say what I feel, but you know, and it was, it was sad. That was like one of the saddest stories. Yeah. And, and that's something that I've tried to do with the show right from the very beginning is um, have that compassion built into it. Yeah. Um, it's really, really tough. And some of the, I, I go back through some of the older episodes and I kind of want to redo some. Yeah. I, mean, I want to revisit. I'll do, I'll do it with you. I want to revisit yeah. some stories. You've learned as you've gone. Yep. Right? Yep. I really do. Um, and some of them, I thought that I had done well at the time, but I look at them now and I think, oh, we could have done a lot better. Yeah. So who knows? I got uh, I got a message from. Uh, all right, let's listen to another voicemail. We have like five this week that we're gonna play. That's Here's great. the fourth one. Good morning, boys. This is Justin out in Summerland, BC. Thanks for putting on such a great product, a great show. I know it's uh, enlightened a lot of stuff around the country for myself, and just how how terrible people can be, but also how great people can be on the other side of all these stuff. Well, thank you for all your hard work and really glad to, glad to have you guys on my podcast list. Take care and poop in your tube. <laughs> well, there you go. We will be pooping in tukings. So, uh, Justin in Summerland. Summerland. You know what? As soon as I picture when I heard, I've never been to Summerland, but right. I, I picture like a Wes Anderson film. Yeah, sure. Like, a Wes Anderson like, film could be set in Summerland. Like this sort of quirky characters like, you know, like Tilda Swinton and Francis McDermott and Adrian Brody and Edward Norton sort of yeah. doing like weird things in this little town that's kind of funky Summerland. and cool. That would Summerland. Be a good, that would actually be a good name for a Wes Anderson movie. I think there was a movie called Summerland, but it wasn't It wasn't Wes Anderson. No. But yeah. And here's our last voicemail. Let's have a listen. Hi guys, this is uh, Sam calling from Toronto. Um, I originally grew up in Langley, BC. Um, I think it's really cool that, uh, cool but also chilling, that kind of as I'm listening through the episodes and listening back to old ones, um, I kind of hear a story from like every neighborhood that I've grown up in throughout the lower mainland and also now in Toronto. I think one of the coolest times was in episode 91, but the murders, sad murders of the two girls in Cranbrook, BC. You give a little shout out to the Tunaka people who are the original settlers of Cranbrook, BC. And I am Tunaka, so it was kind of cool to hear that little shout out, even though you butchered the name slightly, but you did pretty good compared to some other people. Um, 
so yeah, thanks for everything you guys do for the show and go take a shit in your hat. Bye guys. Well, thank you so much. I tend to slaughter a lot of names and it's become a joke. Mike, the name butcher Brown. Yeah. He's uh, a serial name butcher. I will go and try to find a pronunciation of a difficult name and listen to it a number of times, say it a number of times, and then when I read it, as I'm reading Recording. the script, I butcher it again. <laughs> I, I don't know why. I can't get those in my head. And so tomorrow I have to go and read my audio book. Ooh, Speaking of my smell book, her. you can pre-order my book <laughs> on <laughs> darkpoutine.com. Um, there's a link to pre-order my book. Go do that. That would be great. But anyway, so I, I have to record my audio book tomorrow, and I know I'm going to struggle. I know I'm going to have You'll these be fine. struggles. I, 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 Are you recording downtown? I am recording downtown. The Harper Collins has booked a studio, and of course, when you're downtown, I'm going to be in Calgary, and we can't meet up for lunch. No, that sucks. Yeah, it really does suck. And but, tis what it is. Tis what it is. Are you going to do the whole book tomorrow? Or is it a couple of days? No, I'm there for five days. Okay. Well, I'm back tomorrow night. Okay, then I'm let's get together out. maybe. Yeah, come yeah. and see see Steve. See Steve. We'll, Steve we'll take some pictures and maybe. Yeah. Do, we could even do like a live thing from we should. from the Eagle's Nest. We should do one from the Eagle's Nest, especially on the weekend of the rugby. Oh yeah, we could do that. Yeah, because I want you to go to rugby with me, but it's it's our it's the rugby sevens in Vancouver. But it's we, on we record that day, so I'm like, hey, Mike, let's <laughs> okay. we'll figure it out. <laughs> we'll figure it out. We should do it from the rugby game with cheering crowds, <laughs> and then. <laughs> The person was murdered, and you hear, ah, just a fan. Are there going to actually be fans in the stands? I guess Rugby Sevens. Well, since they're selling tickets, I guess so. <laughs> Is it only 50% of? No idea. Yeah, that's weird. I don't, okay. I don't care. I'm willing to die for rugby. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're both double vaxxed. I, I'm not overly concerned. No. For I want, us. I want to get the third one. You want to get the third one? A yeah. little booster shot? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people want to get that and. It kind of makes sense. Um, and that's it for voicemails this week. You can leave us one at one 327 5786 or 1-877-D-A-R-K-P-T-N. PTN. PTN. Uh, now it's on to Patreon. Patreon. And Donut Money Donors. So we don't have any Donut Money Donors this week, which is fine. Irene called and left a, a voicemail message and but, gave us Donut Money last week. Yes. So uh, thank you, Irene. Again, uh, but as far as patrons go, from Alliston, Ontario, we have Johanna Parker. Johanna Parker. And what does Johanna do there in Alliston, Ontario, Matthew? Is it Johanna or Joanna? Uh, it looks like Johanna. Okay. Yeah. I think I think Alliston is now called New Tecumseh or something like that. Okay. So they've changed the name. I think so. Okay. If I can remember, because I'm not, you know. Right. You don't live in Ontario anymore. But um, uh, Joanna is a tobacco farmer. Oh, she farms tobacco. Yep. That sandy soil in Ontario. Perfect uh, for tobacco. Yeah. Well, I used to love the tobacco. I smoked a pack a day. Did You smoked, didn't you? No. Oh, you never did. You just vaped. I vaped. You started vaping. Yeah. Which is weird. I used to love, you know, the whole ritual of lighting up a cigarette. I was just, t I was developing something for a big tobacco company, mm -hmm. one of their vape lines, and I was like taste testing ones. Oh, God. And then one day woke up and I was like, oh, my God, nicotine's addictive. Because I'm like, why do I feel weird? Like, I need something. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> addicted to the nicotine. Yep. Well, don't go and start work for a cocaine company or a... <laughs> yeah, no, probably not a good no, thing. No, that would not be good. So thank you, Johanna. <laughs> Thanks, and Johanna. Keep growing your tobacco. There in Alliston, Ontario, or New Tecumseh, yeah, whatever I think it's it is. called. Call, call us and tell us if it's called New Tecumseh. I can't remember the story of Tecumseh, but I, I recall it from high, or from elementary school, I think. I'll hmm. have to look it up. Yeah. Uh, next up we have Nikita Ross. And Nikita is from Elmsdale, Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia, a blue noser. Gotta love when the blue, blue nosers noser. uh, step up and... Help the show by becoming patrons. And what does Nikita do there in Elms, Elmsdale? Elms what? Elmsdale. 
I've always liked the name Nikita. Yeah. And I think it just she, reminds me of uh, Elton John. Yeah. I think she's a assassin. Uh, oh, like the Nikita, uh, the assassin. Yeah. yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. And what does she assassinate? Is is it like political assassinations or um, political? You know, political? Oh, yeah. so she's not just like hitting people who owe money or anything like that. She's no. not like the Iceman. No, no, no. She, she, she gets rid of presidents and prime ministers. Oh, dear. Yeah. We didn't say that. <laughs> Nobody. Sorry, Nikita, getting you into trouble. I'm, well, I'm blowing your cover. Yeah, don't blow her cover. <laughs> She's a flower per. She sells flowers on the side of the road. That's what she yes, really And does. that's why she lives in Elmsdale. She thought it was a good cover. Nobody would think an international assassin lives in Elmsdale. Well, it's true. It's true. Yeah. Yeah, Nova Scotia is full of international assassins, I'm sure. It's the entire province is filled with them. Yeah, my mom. <laughs> with her Glock. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't want to see that. Mom with a Glock. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Oh, boy. Next, we have Aaron Cook. And Aaron is from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And Min Minneapolis was in the news in a big way last year. Yes. A yeah. lot of... Uh, upheaval. Yeah. Over that murder. The George Floyd murder. murder yeah. 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 Um, so what on earth does Aaron do in Minneapolis, Minnesota? Uh, I think Tarjay is headquarters there. So he works at she? Tar Aaron with two A's. Oh, is it an Aaron? Yes. An Aaron with two A's, not an Aaron with an E. Yeah. So I'm assuming Aaron with two A's is, is... Uh, of the okay. Hi, male Aaron. personage. Hi, Aaron. Yes. I think he works for Tarjay. Tarjay? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I used to like Tarjay when it was here, but I always found the shelves were so, so empty. Really? Yeah. Well, probably I'm Aaron because he's he's a orange juice buyer. He buys orange juice for Tarjay. Well, orange juicers. Orange he, juicers? Yeah, orange juicers. Things to make orange juice. Oh, okay. Yeah, so he travels the world and, and gets deals on orange juicers. Well, there's a lot of those. Yeah. That's, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. You know those really cool ones? I know the ones. That look yeah. like an alien as well. Like just. Yeah, you can buy really sort of funky ones. Yeah, yeah. Aaron's responsible for that shit. Well, thanks, Aaron. Yeah. And thank you for your patronage. Thank you, Aaron. Much appreciated. Thanks to all the patrons and Donut Money donors, past and present, for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash dark poutine. Or for a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot to us if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Before we go, let's see who's still listening. Okay. We have a book giveaway. <gasps> a book giveaway. A book giveaway. So for our American listeners only, author Alan R. Warren is offering 10 advanced ebook reading copies of American Nocturne by Hank Schwabel. That's pronounced table. See, he gave me instructions because he knows that I slaughter names. So Hank Schwabel's book will go to the first 10 Americans to email Alan at radiocub at gmail.com. That's radiocub with two Bs, R-A-D-I-O-C-U-B-B -B -B at gmail.com. And you'll get a copy of the book. Remember, Americans only. Good luck. And that is it. Um... Yeah. Please check out darkpoutine.com for show notes and other cool stuff. Please take the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening and tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. Until we return, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye-bye. Goodbye.